see what we really value. And we have to learn to value what's most important. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 real quick. Let's go, bro. We got to learn to value what's most important. In the Come Matthew, on, sorry. In the Matthew chapter 13, and we'll pick it up here at verse 44. And it's the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl, right? And we understand parables are, are, are pretty much, you know, moral stories with a spiritual meaning. And so what, what is the meaning God is trying to teach here? In verse 44, it says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. Just think about that. Like, you know, probably for the sisters with jewelry or diamonds or whatever. It's like, wow, I'm searching for that, 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 that amazing fine pearl. I know Jordan can relate. She's engaged, you know, like she has the, the, that, that rock that's on her finger that's just bling, bling, you know, it's just Let's go, Jordan. so bright as a fine pearl, right? And then in verse 46, it says, when he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it, right? And here we see two types of people. We see uh, one is actually, you know, just stumbles upon uh, something that's very valuable, which was the kingdom. And he sells everything he has for it. And then we have one who's actually searching for it and searching for the truth and searching for that relationship with God. And they find it. And what was their response? The same exact thing. And it teaches us what, what should our responses be? Well, once we find the kingdom and, and, and we, we got to cherish it, but also we got to be willing to give everything up for it. Right. And this is what you see in both their responses. And it's because in, in the heart, in our hearts, we understand that we value it, that we want to be a part of it, so we cherish it, and we see it as very important. And it's the same way for us. We got to see our need for God and our value in our relationship with God, but also our value with God's kingdom, which is each other. You know, so we learn to value what's important. And so it leads up to my my title of the lesson today is, "Don't be discordant, but value what's important." Don't be discordant, but value what. Wow, you come on, bro. You know, and this is something I feel like God has been teaching me, you know, like to value what's important, <laughs> honestly, you know, and not to even for myself to be discordant. You know, discordant comes from that word discord, right? And it's, it's usually a, a disagreement. Like you're in conflict, you're at, you're at odds, right? It's, it's really a, a musical term. Um, and then everything is supposed to be uni unifying and, and, and harmonious. Uh, but discordant is, is totally you disagree with that, right? And, and, and so you wrestle with it because you want to do what you want to do and God wants you to do something else. And so we go wrestle with these things in our heart and it really shows through the fruit of our actions. So I always believe, well, you don't disciple more so the fruit, you disciple the root. And what's the root? Well, it's our heart matters, right? And for many of us, we, we grew up in a society where we're entitled, <laughs> And we think just because we are charismatic, everyone should like us. But that's really not the case. Uh, we think just because we have success in doing things one way and in the way how we did it in the world, that we think once we get in the kingdom, everything is going to be the same exact way. And we should be rewarded accordingly. You know, our thinking could be worldly at times. Well, if I just act a certain way and put on a particular type of dress, um, or dress a certain way, have my hair cut, whatever it may be, and flirt with that sister, well, maybe she liked me all of a sudden now. Or for the sisters, if I just flirt with him, maybe he will like me. And we're all screaming in the same sense of for acceptance. We're all screaming for to be loved. But in reality, everything in the kingdom is totally upside down. <laughs> you see, uh, actually flirt with the brother and sister in the kingdom is like, man, it's sin. <laughs> it's just flat out sin. And for a spiritual woman of God, she's going to look at that brother and be like, that is disgusting and gross. Because she values her relationship with God more than doing something as sinful as such and being caught up in the flirtation oh, matter, just like the world. But we understand, like, we're not the kingdom. <laughs> you know, we're not the kingdom if we're living that way, right? We can't be like the world and, and doing the things that the world does. We got to see that we're got to be holy and pure, godly people that actually is the kingdom of God. And so we got to live according to just that. And so now our acceptance is not predicated on man and other people and their viewpoint of us, but our acceptance 
should come from God. And our idea of feeling love should only come from God. And whenever these things are replaced by someone or something that's above God, then it's just flat out not okay. You know, God has to be our number one, you know, and we have to see our need for God and have conviction in that, that God accepts me for who I am and he loves me for who I am. And that has to be enough, you know? And if it's not, then sadly, like I'm talking about, then it could be discordish and we find ourselves wrestling with God is really trying to teach us and show us here, you know, and we wrestle with the promises that God has instilled for us to have, but we can't take hold of it because we're wrestling and we just don't accept what God has put on before us. So as disciples, what we got to do, well, we have to renew our minds, just like it talks about in Romans 12, we got to renew our minds and, and, and offer ourselves as living sacrifices and, ha and have God's perspective, not our perspective, Right, but have God's perspective, and, and and some for some of us we gotta fight for this every single day. It's not it's not just a one and done thing. No, like even for myself, I have to fight and, and and move my mind back to this train of thinking that hey, I'm enough because God said I'm enough. You know, God loves me, and let that be the end of the story. You know, and so that in the kingdom. We got to understand this upside down and our weaknesses can actually become strength because of our reliance on who? God. And, and, and we understand, well, when we actually humble, God actually lifts us up in his due time. And then when you're a servant to God and God's people, guess what? You're considered the greatest in God's kingdom. It's an upside down kingdom. Logically, it doesn't make sense from our human, humanistic mindset, but this is what it means to be godly. It's totally doing the opposite of what you did in the world. And so we got to learn to value the right things. And in order for us to value what's important, well, and, and be the, the awesome men and women God so desires, well, I want to hit on two things today. Is one, embrace what God is teaching us. And two, storing up treasures in heaven. Let's go to my first point. Embrace what God is teaching. Let's go to Matthew chapter six. So during my quiet times lately, I, I've been reading and just really studying um, Jesus' life and how he, how he carried himself, you know, actually. And uh, I've been doing, like, doing it chronologically, so it's been really uh, fun. So a couple of weeks back, you know, I, I was learning about Jesus, you know, uh, at his birth and then how he's just grown since then. And now I'm in Jesus when he begins his ministry and everything. And, um, you know, in context here in this scripture, Matthew 6, he's on the Sermon on the Mount. So now he's preaching to the multitudes of people. And that's and it's at this point where Jesus literally gives like a 20 point lesson. You know, I only got two points for you, but Jesus had like 20 point lesson. Just calling people to the real Christian life if they wanted to follow, him, you know. And, uh, and we see here Jesus just preaching to the multitudes of people. And uh, he's preaching, he's teaching about what it means to be a Christian. And we pick it up here in Matthew chapter six. And let's read verse one. It says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. Drop down to verse five. It says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. Drop down to verse 16. It says, when you fast, do not look sober as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put on oil on your head and wash your face so that it would not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You know, we see here, that there were those who were people focused <laughs> and there were those who were totally God focused, you know? And, and, and for some of us, we could be people focused. We get so caught up in our appearances and what people think of us. And it's a natural thing. Don't get me wrong. We all compare ourselves. We compare ourselves to, to the person that seemed like they had it all together, but really they may not have it all together. But we naturally compare ourselves to the people. And it's just ingrained in us. Why? Because we're Americans, <laughs> you know? And, and as Americans, we, we constantly are trying to, strive to be better than what we are and we're stepping our brothers and sisters neck to get to the top 
And so we naturally compare ourselves like, oh man, she's more prettier. Oh man, like her skin tone. Oh man, she's taller or more, oh, her hair is straight, like whatever it may be. Like we naturally can, can, can compare ourselves for the guys like, man, um, man, he's successful. Man, he has all the, the everything's going well for him. But, but me in my life, I, I just, I'm, no, I'm a nobody, you know? And we just naturally compare ourselves. And sometimes that could bleed into the kingdom. We get so caught up in other people and what they think in our appearance, and we totally miss the main focus, you know? And God says that these people will get their full reward. Represent their reward only matters only on earth, but never in heaven, right? And they won't be able to receive the rewards from God in heaven because their hearts were not in the right place. And just like it talks about in Matthew 15, 8, like you don't got to turn it there, but you know, that's what Jesus is teaching to the Pharisees who are the religious people, right? And he says, hey, they give God so much lip service. They're so focused on what people thought that their hearts were actually far away from God. Like, what a scary sight. It shows like, man, you could be going to church and your heart is still totally away from God. And it just goes to show, man, like it, it, it has to be a deeper reverence for God in such ways. And it just can't give God lip service. Like, oh, I believe in God. Well, my pastor this, my pastor that. Like, no, it doesn't mean anything. You can still be like that and give God lip service and still be apart from God. And so these religious people totally lost the main focus of their worship. You know, that worship is truly all about God and God only. It's not about, hey, if I worship God, then I will get that girl. Like, no, you missed the point. Well, if I worship God, well, I'll get that guy. No, you totally missed the point. Worship is only about God, <laughs> you know? And so these guys lose their perspective and their outlook. And if you see in verse 18, it says, so it won't be obvious to others that they were fasting, right? They were so focused on their approval and acceptance of men. And they, again, they totally lost focus of the approval and acceptance from God where it really matters. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so we all want acceptance and we all want to feel love, but it only matters that that acceptance is only coming from God. Because I guess what? Man, people are going to hurt you. Not everybody's going to like you. It's just, it's the reality. And the same thing, yeah, even so when you're in the kingdom, not everybody has to like you. We're called to love you and be like Christians, but not everybody is forced to like you. <laughs> it's, it's, we, okay. we're, 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 we're called to be like Christ so we love and forgive each other, but you can't force someone to like you and accept you. Right, like you, you can't force that upon someone. Like you gotta understand, you gotta find your need and your and your and your and your desires and your heart desires from God and God only. Because we understand God won't disappoint. But guess what? I will disappoint you. <laughs> but some of you guys probably had an expectation of me, like I blew it. Dang, I don't like Tyree no more. Like for sure, I'm I'm sinful. Like I have limitations. Like you know what I mean? Like I, I'm only one person. And you probably learned this in a real way in the kingdom. Like, oh man, it's the church. It's supposed to be perfect. They're supposed to be like Jesus. No one should ever hurt me. Man, like where are you reading in the Bible? Like the church totally will hurt you. Your brothers and sisters totally will hurt you. Like you have an expectation someone might should do the dishes. But guess what? They got, they got so focused on other things. They got distracted. And now the dishes just piling up. And now you say like, hey, how many times I got to tell you to do the dishes? And it's just hurtful. <laughs> but now God's put you in a situation to learn to forgive and learn to, to do what's godly and righteous, right? And so we could totally miss the, 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 the aspect of what God is really trying to teach us. And, it's, and, it's just, and it just goes again to our heart matters. And God sees what's done in secret. I see it here in verse 18. It's really cool. Like God sees what you're doing when no one's watching. Like we could put up a front, be on a camera, look nice, and man, sing songs and be fired up. And like, but when we cut off this call, I can't see you, but you know who can? God. You know what? When, at, at night time, when you get ready to go to sleep and you close the door, you know who can see you? God. Like, so it says, hey, like, God sees what's done in, in secret. So it made me think, like, well, where else does God see us doing things in secret? I cannot help but think about Hebrews 4, where it talks about God will judge our thoughts and the attitude of our heart. Nothing is hidden from God. God sees everything. And so in the same way, since God sees everything, our thoughts, our heart matters, because I can't see what you're thinking. I don't even know what you're feeling, but you know who does? God. Just like someone cannot see what you do behind closed doors, but you know who could see you? God. And, and according to that, man, well, God would judge us accordingly to those things, our thoughts, 
our attitudes and the things we do with our lives. And so God exposes our sin. And in our sin, two things actually happen. We can actually struggle in our reflection and we don't rely on ourselves just like we always had. Or we can stop and just give everything up and start to rely on God. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. This is great, bro. Come on. In Hebrews chapter 12. And let's kind of, I was going to start at verse 4. Let's start there in verse 4. And it says, in your struggle against sin, <laughs> you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of Lord's discipline. And do not lose heart when he rebukes you. We'll pause here. So in the same way, God is like, man, treating you as his child because he loves you. But it also says, hey, and you're struggling against sin. And in the moments of uncomfortability, in the moments where you just, your sin is exposed, just remind yourself like, hey, Jesus went through something way far greater. Like we never struggle to the point of shedding our blood. Like only thing we probably got is like a parking ticket or maybe, a, or maybe our debit card wasn't working or maybe our debit card has to get sent in the mail. Or maybe like, like someone just said something wrong because they had a bad day. And like all of a sudden, like we just throw everything out the window. We throw our Christianity out the window. Like we're not Christians all of a sudden now. You know, we just act so sinful. And this could be our responses. And so really God has really disciplined us in these matters. And it says that when God disciplines us, you know, you can respond two ways. You can be like, well, you can see it as a light situation. I'm this type of person where it's like, you know, like, ah, I, can, I can muscle through it. It's, it's not big of a deal. I got this. And then all of a sudden it just boils up and it boils up and it boils up. And that's, you know, I explode. And it becomes very ungodly. And they got some people who just lose heart. They just very discouraged. Like, no one cares. Like, no one loves me. Like, so-and-so dating. Like, so-and-so is married. I want that. Like, God doesn't love me. Like, does he really care? Like just and we just get so discouraged so discouraged and it's simple both of them you know whether you blowing up in your anger or whether you just being discouraged it's, it's both simple so really what god is trying to teach us here well let's keep reading in verse six it says because the lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son and through a hardship as discipline god is treating you as his children but what children are not disciplined by their father if you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, you're not legitimate, not true sons or daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the land may not be disabled, but rather healed. You know, I love this passage because in verse 6, here's a reminder. It says, hey, God disciplines though he loves. It's just a reminder, like, man, God loves you. <laughs> and then it says, and not just that, he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts. Like, hey, you want acceptance? Someone probably forgot your name and, and lift you up doing like the good news sharing. Hey, guess what? God accepts you. Like, let that be enough and let that be the end of the story. But then it's crazy because it says in verse eight, everyone undergoes discipline. So it made me think like, dang, everyone, like even a non-Christian, even a Christian, everyone goes through this craziness called life and God allows it to happen. And God sees that like, man, everyone goes through discipline. And it made me think, you know how like you're looking in the Bible, and you're like, man, like little, little tiny words that seem very simple. You think like, what does that word mean again? <laughs> you know? And so I looked up this little word, like, all right, discipline. What does that mean again? Like I heard it. I kind of forgot, you know? And uh, the word discipline is the practice of training people to obey our code of behavior, right? Using punishment to correct their disobedience. I'll say it again. Discipline is the practice of training people to obey our code of behavior using punishment to correct their disobedience. And so we have to understand in a real way that God is training us. And he's training us with life and he allows such situations to happen in our lives to really teach us right from wrong so that we can share in this holiness, right? And God is training us for our good, 
right? And let this training from God make you more holy and not more sinful, right? And so for us as disciples, what we have to do is learn to embrace what God is teaching us and get fascinated in what God has us exactly at this exact moment, you know? And it's really a matter of choice. Because like I said, you could decide, like, you know what? I'm going to rely on myself. And then you just find yourself more disciplined and because your disobedience is not willing to submit to what God has put before you. And you just find yourself wrestling and fighting against God. Like God made it clear, but you just find yourself like, no, I don't want that God. So you discordish, like we talked about, because you disagree and you're wrestling with God has put in your plate. But man, it's a choice to just surrender. Like, you know what? It's in God's hand. I'm going to just trust God, what God is teaching me and get fascinated with what God has me where I'm at, you know? And then you think about this, this, this teaching and this training, I cannot but help think about in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Because we see here in the Hebrews when it says, you know, it produces a, a harvest of righteousness. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, it says, all scripture is God breathed and then useful for teaching, co rebuking, correcting, and training, right? That training aspect in what? Righteousness. So that the servant of God, the men and women alike, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God trains us through his word and also by the situations he places us in. So like, hey, God may place you in a situation at work and he's still expecting you to still be righteous. God may place you in a situation with your family because the holidays are coming up. Hey, and guess what? God still expects you to be righteous. God may place you in a situation when like things go totally bad. But God still expects you to still be righteous in your affliction, you know? And, and not getting so caught up in being right. Like, oh, man, I'm right, and I need to be justified. Like, no, 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 no. Like a man that shared vulnerably in the communion. Only justful person is God. We all for our shirt. We all for our shirt. We all sinful, right? So we can't get caught up on being right, but learning to be righteous in everything. Not just on Sunday. Not just at Devo, not just at Midweek, not just at Bible Talk, but at everything, especially when no one is looking, right? Because you are who you are at home. You are who you are when no one is looking at you. That's the true you. That's the true you. You know, you are who you are at home. And um, it's crazy because, you know, in Matthew 6, verse 33, it says, God says to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And I know sometimes for me, I, I can teach it. And I, I get so caught up like, hey, God says, hey, put first the kingdom. You need to seek God, his kingdom, the church, yada, yada, yada. But sometimes we forget that word in his righteousness. You need both. It's a conjunction. You know, it's a conjunction. You need both. Yes, we need to seek God and be committed and seek his kingdom. But also the Bible says, hey, you need to put his righteousness first as well. And it's crazy. We can't get, we, we got to be learned to be righteous in everything we do. And, and, and the great indicator of this that I learned is, well, how do you know you're doing this thing then? Well, ask yourself this. Am I being righteous in my affliction? <laughs> you know, am I being like Jesus when things are not just going good, but also when things are going bad, you know? And I guarantee a lot of us, whether we believe in God or not, or we're a disciple or not, we all far short in this. And it's just really a lack of surrender. And it's crazy because this is how I felt these last couple of weeks, to be honest, to be vulnerable, vulnerable moment, right? It's like, I've been feeling so stretched, like so stretched to the point I want to snap, right? And sadly in my sin, uh, you know, in my sin, it's starting to get exposed. You know, I become a little bit more edgy. Uh, not edgy, like, man, let's go for it. But like edgy, like, yo, leave me alone. Like, Stop asking the same thing, like get it on, get it together. Like, you know, uh, very impatient, uh, just very short, uh, harsh at times with words, very cranky. Uh, Cause I'm also like, uh, you know, lacking sleep here, but also like it still doesn't give me any excuse to, to, to act this way, right? So very cranky. And when I'm cranky, I'm a little bit more angry as well. Um, like I'm helping people, but I'm, I, I learned these last couple of days too. It's like, I'm helping, I'm giving my heart, but Sometimes it, take, it takes a lot. You know how it takes a lot? Like, man, I know I should do this. The good I ought to do. But, man, like, all right, fine, I'll do it. Fine, I'll do this. i do it. But, like, it's just like with a bad heart with grumbling and complaining, you know? <laughs> and, uh, I got to get my heart fully there. I need to pray Esther, you know, 
one prayer is not enough, two prayers not enough. Sometimes I need like a prayer throughout the day uh, just to get my heart there, you know. And because in a real way for me, like I am whipped, I am tired. Like we've been given like a lot this past month and let alone like this new month and just trying to push and push. And part of me want to settle. Part of me wants to be like, you know what? I want to finish the episodes, The Last Dance. I just finished it last night, but I want to finish it for like the longest. It took me like two months, you know? Like I wanted to do what I wanted to do, you know? I want to chill, check out a little bit. As men, for men, like that's what we do. We go home, we want to check out. But God is teaching me, guess what? I can't just check out at home because I have a wife. And guess what? She has needs and I got to make sure I'm prioritizing her. Well, not just that, like her condition. Well, she's pregnant. She is pregnant. So her needs a little bit has increased. And part of me, I'm like, no, like I got to build another, like I got to build something else that pertains to our baby. I had to build a crib, I had to build a bookshelf. Had to, and I'm like, okay, cool. Oh, babe, it's another package. I'm um, in the mail that just came. I was like, oh, for sure. Like, <laughs> amen, babe. You know, but my heart's kind of like wrestling here. You know, I'm like, dang. But I'm just trying to be spiritual and kind of be fake. You know, I'm kind of fake in that sense where I'm like, hey, man, babe, come on. Like, little kids, come like, on, babe. Little kids, like, hey, I, I don't have a bad heart, but really deep down, I have a bad heart about it. You know, it's just selfish. And like, she's bearing our child. I'm just so selfish. This is my sin, right? And um, that's not to even talk about all the other commitments, right? Like, man, like, leading a region is, is draining. Like, I got to, like, give myself over and over every single day and help meet the needs of the, the whole entire region. Like pour myself out to the people I lead in the core leadership and see them raise up and mature. And, I, and I'm fired up about that. But man, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a taking, you know, from my energy, it's a taking um, from, from my faith, if you will. And um, not just that, it's also trying to put on like this uh, national blood drive. So now we're trying to help coordinate with over 20 churches and if you know something about even in a workforce, like when it comes to coordinating an event, you're not just helping one person and trying to like work with their schedule. You're, multi you're working with multiple people's schedules and we're all different time zones. And it's just like, come on guys, we need this info ASAP. And some people, some people just dialed in and some people just, it's like pulling teeth. So guess what? That costs more effort. That costs more, more effort to give, right? And then find out this past week, we're, we're going to be leading a new ministry and I'm fired up about it. Don't get me wrong. It's a, it's a, it's an act of grace and an act to serve in, a, in an incredible way. But I just feel like God has just been piling more and more on my plate, you know, and I totally believe God won't, won't give me more if I can handle it. So I believe that God believes in us and believes in me that I can carry these things and carry this load. But honestly, guys, sometimes my perspective just flies out the window. I'm like, Oh, like forget this. No, you know, and I'm just, I'm in sin, you know, like I'm in sin, you know, oh, and, uh, it's crazy. It is so crazy. And so I had to like go back to a focus, like, okay, what is God teaching me? What is, what is God easily teaching me? You know, God has been teaching me. He's been correcting me. He's been training me and not just leading the region, but also in my marriage and not just in my marriage, but even at work, like sadly to my shame, guys, this past week, I've been late like multiple times to work. It's not cool. Like, I know, again, like we talked about the Hebrew scripture, we could be like, we could take it lightly, right? We could take God's discipline lightly. Like, oh, it's not a big deal. Like, no one really cares. But no, God does care. Because guess what I'm supposed to represent? God. I'm a representation of God. I'm supposed to be a Christian. But I'm late to work. And not just that, it's kind of embarrassing because I'm like one of the oldest guys uh, at my job. So I'm supposed to lead by example. You know, I'm a grown man and it's like a bunch of teens on time. I don't care if it's like, I got to be at work at 6 a.m. I got to get up at like around 4 so what? The expectation is still the same, you know? So I have to be um, righteous in all the areas of my lives. And, and, it's, and, it's, and God's been stretching me thin because he's been forcing me to grow, guess what, in all of these areas of my life. <laughs> and and that's what we learned in the Second Timothy scripture. It says, hey, it's supposed to train you to be what? Not religious. Hey, not to rely on yourself, but it's supposed to train you to be righteous so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Like God is calling you to be a Christian in every single commitment of your life, not just on Sunday. And so in a real way, man, we could be just come like on, the Pharisees. Tyree. We could be just like the Pharisees has come like, oh, it's good. And you expect God to honor your heart when you just want to clock in, when you want to clock in and not worship God and sing songs. You expect God to honor your heart when you're laying down in bed and we're at Sunday 
service. It's total disrespect. You know, we, we want God to do so much for us, but we can't even give God our full heart. Come God on, Tyree. In us. God is teaching you right from wrong so you can share in this holiness. Why? Because God loves you. God accepts you, right? And that's what we got to be fascinated in what God is teaching us. And so the challenge I want to uh, call us, because I know for me, it started to call me to be very dis discontent, right? Not as happy. Like, it's kind of funny that Aaron shares that scripture in Psalm 119, that uh, true supposed to be happiness comes from our devotion and seeking to God. Well, that wasn't like my week, honestly, in my sinful nature. Like, it's been struggling, bro. Like, <laughs> it's been a struggle. Uh, but I'm fighting. I'm faithful. And I know God can work. Come so on, bro. Me, I have to remind myself to value what's important, right? I have to remind myself, like, you know what? I'm so caught up in the things that's going bad and all these different things. But I should focus on the things that God has given me and cherish the little things and value those things. Because, I, I, again, I want to compare myself. Like, man, I'm not right, here yet. Like, God, like, we need to grow. We need to push. But God has given me what I have. And I got to be okay with that. God has put me where I'm at, and I got to be okay with that, and I have to be enough, you know? So for me, I started to lack gratitude, <laughs> you know? And so for me, I started to see, like, wow, I'm wrestling with God because I'm not content. I'm not happy where God has me right now, you know? So the, the, the call I want to challenge you guys with, because I know I'm not alone in this because we all have sin, but I want to call you guys to write 10 things that you're grateful for about God. You know, as simple as it is, because sometimes we can lose our focus, our perspective. Like, man, God has you where he wants you. Yeah. Like, again, we compare ourselves. We want to be at a different place. We want things because we're entitled. But it's not like that in the kingdom. Our ultimate focus on our center should come from God. And so God has to be enough, right? And so just write 10 things you're grateful for about your relationship with God. And it helps you get God focused. It helps you get, you know, not focus on yourself or other people, but focus on God. My second point storing up godly treasures let's go to matthew chapter six again i was just studying out the lifestyle of jesus and it's so awesome it's so convicting and it's challenging but it's so faith building in matthew chapter six point number two storing up godly treasures in matthew chapter six we'll pick it up here in verse 19 it says do not store it for yourselves Treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, dear, your heart will be also. Drop down to verse 24. It says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You know. We see here, God is, is reminded and he's calling us to store up treasures in heaven. And it's, it's a literally an, our investment in the godly things, right? And it says, hey, don't store up treasures on, on earth where, where moss and vermin can destroy. Where vermin is basically like just wild animals. The wild animals will destroy these different things, right? Uh, the insects, it, you know, they will just destroy the crops, you know, and you can't get no return because why? It, it comes to an end. Everything that's worldly at some point comes to an end. Nothing lasts forever on earth. Um, if people got cars, I guarantee you, you drive your car is new. And as time goes on, your car starts to deteriorate. You buy a house, guarantee you, like those things deteriorate and it lose value with time. But never with the things that's godly. The things of godly, it actually, it gains more value. Because the more you draw closer to God, man, you grow and you become more valuable. And you'll become a valuable asset to also God's kingdom, where God starts to lift you up on his due time. And so, Jesus says, hey, you know, store up treasures in heaven. And in verse 21, it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be awesome. And let's go over to Luke chapter 12, because I like the parallel passage to the scripture as well. Let's go over to uh, Luke chapter 12. Come on, bro. Bible, like we got to let the Bible reconcile the Bible. And, uh, you know, we see a different account of this same passage in Luke chapter 12. And we pick it up here in verse 32. And then verse 32 says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that would not wear out. A treasure in heaven that would never fail, 
where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, this is just so flat amazing. Because here in verse 32, it says, man, God is pleased to give you the kingdom. And remember, like the heart of the, like, the guys that found the value of the kingdom, they cherished it. They seen it as important. And God is pleased to give you not only a relationship with himself, the king, but also the kingdom of people who are actually committed to God and his will as well. Right. And so, like, it is awesome. That pleases God. But it's interesting, too, because in verse 33, it says the cost is to give up everything for it. Right. To give up your life, to give up your comfort, to give up your, your, your time to give up your personal dreams, to give up your sin, the things that hold you back from a relationship with God. And you do it not because of me. You don't do it for JL. You don't do it for the SFBICC. You don't do it for Kip. No, you do it all for God <laughs> and God only, right? And, and so you put your hope and your treasures in heaven and you get God focused and then you invest in the relationships with God. And in verse 34, it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's like that, that, that reiteration that we all need that reminder. And so let's look at an example of a guy who wasn't willing to store up treasures in heaven. Let's go to Mark chapter 10. Let's look at an example of a guy who wasn't willing to store up treasures in heaven. In Mark chapter 10. Y'all with me? Yeah. You, Come on, bro. Let's go. Thank you. Absolutely, bro. Thank you, there, bro. Let's get it. Mark, Mark 10. Super convicted. Mark chapter 10. We pick it up here. Verse 17. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You, not sh you should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not give false testimony. You should not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he de uh, declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. and You will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face filled. He went away sad because he had great wealth. We'll pause here. So we see here in verse 21, Jesus said, you lack one thing. And he said one thing, it's interesting. He says, hey, you lack one thing, but he calls him to do several things, right? He says, hey, sell everything you have, like just give it up. The comfort, the time, all this stuff, just give it up, right? Um, his life, his entitlement to the worldly pleasure and the worldly possessions, it was just idolatry in his life. His own wealth was his idol, right? And he said, you know what? Give those things to the poor. You know, it's just, it's teaching us to, 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 to be giving, right, to others rather than just soaking it all in for ourselves and worrying about self. And then Jesus says, hey, once you do those things and give it all up, then come follow me. Like, Jesus could have made it easy. Like, hey, man, yeah, you're right. That's awesome. You've been, you've been reading your Bible since you was a kid. Oh, that's, that's awesome. You, you've been going to church. I love that. All right, cool. Come follow me. Like, no, 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 no. Jesus understood he had one thing that he lacked that was going to stop him from having a true relationship with God. And here's the thing. Though the standard was to give everything up, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Just to show like, man, God loves the, the righteous as well as the unrighteous. Kind of, again, aligned with what Amanda was sharing earlier. Like, we deserve death because we all sinful. But God is so compassionate and loving that, hey, he still calls us to the truth of his word. And what's the truth of his word? Like, man, the Bible. And so the same cause is the same for this guy. Like Jesus wasn't caught up in like, hey, this guy read his Bible. This guy lived it out a little bit. But Jesus knew that one thing that was going to stop him from having a true relationship with God. And so what Jesus does, he doesn't go around the bush. He doesn't like, hey, man, like sweep it under the rug and just forget about it. No, he calls him to that exact one thing that's going to stop him from not having a relationship with him, right? And so that can be a challenging thing because we all know that one thing that can really stop us from having a true relationship with God. And it all goes to a matter of will. You know, do you really want to give yeah. it up? And so the guy walks away sad. But here's the funny part. Jesus still loved him, but he walks away sad. So it's not Jesus' fault, <laughs> but it's the person's fault and their decision making. And we see why. Well, he wanted to just hold on to his worldly possessions. He thought it would make him happy. 
He thought if he just hold on to these things and not let go to what God was trying to call it and yank from him, because God knew that it was sinful and it knew it could destroy him because God wants us to store up treasures in heaven. But he only held on to this worldly possession, the treasures of earth. And he didn't want to give that up because he thought it was going to make him happy. Right. And here's the crazy part. God gives him what he wants, what he wants. Sometimes like we don't want to let things go. And, God, and God's like, hey, like I'm trying to I'm trying to like tell you, like, don't do that. Don't do that. And then it gets to a point where God's like, OK, hey, take it. Just take it. You know, you, you want that that bad. You want that more than me. Here you go. Take it. You know, you want this water? Hell, take it. Hey, you want that relationship? You know what? Take it. Hey, you want that job um, that doesn't align up with your schedule? Hey, just, just take it. You know, and we want this so bad and we think it's going to make us happy. But here's the funny part. Look at verse 22. Though he has it and God doesn't snatch it away from him. God doesn't force. He's not a, a you know what I mean? Like he doesn't take it from him. God's like, hey, you want that? Take it. But the guy still walks away sad. And it just shows, it's crazy. It's like, it just goes to show the things we think or assume that we actually need that's going to make us happy actually does not make us happy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and it just shows like, man, the true happiness comes from those who seek and put their treasures in heaven. Like, man, you think that relationship is going to make you happy, but it, it doesn't. It might be actually toxic for you. You don't know, right? And God is trying to protect you from it because he's treating you as his child. Right. He knows the good you ought to do. He sees your life panning out and he sees the decisions you make. And he's like, dang, why, why would he do this? Why would he do that? You know, and it's crazy. So we think we know better than God. And it's crazy. And a lot of us can be like this. And we, and we want to hold on to the things that we think, quote unquote, is going to make us happy. And it actually does not. Even when we have it. And we still, our lives are still miserable. And we still doesn't change because we never gave anything up. We never put and trusted everything into God's hands. Let's go, Tyree. Heaven, right? And you think, well, what was this treasure stored? It was stored in the world. It was stored in the world where the moss and vermin destroy, right? And where Jesus was trying to tell him to store his treasure, where? In heaven, in verse 21. He said in verse 21, he says, hey, you know, do all these different things. And you will have treasure in heaven. Jesus was giving them an answer, like, bro, you will have treasure in heaven. But he held on to these things that he thought would be right and make him happy. And he wasn't willing to store treasures in heaven. And he walked away sad. So let's look at the heart that we should have. Let's keep reading. In verse 23, it says, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up. We have left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied. No one who has left home, our brothers, our sisters, our mother, our father, our children, our fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecution in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. You see here, it's the upside down kingdom. We think the things that's going to make us happy actually leads to our downfall. And God said, like, hey, let these things go so you can actually have true happiness, right? And we learned from Peter, who's a disciple, and what was his heart? He's like, hey, man, we left everything to follow you. And, you know, and, and in context of John 6, Jesus preached hardcore and he preached the same message. He called people to the same standard. He didn't bend. This is still the same truth. And the only way to God is, is through, the, through, um, through Jesus. So it's the same message. And sadly, in John 6, you see a lot of people desert him. A lot of people didn't like the message Jesus called on them too because they lacked that one thing. And Jesus called them to give up that one thing. And so they were unwilling. They disagreed with it. And so they walked away sad. And even Jesus looks at his leaders and the apostles like, hey, do you want to leave too? And, and Peter, who's the disciples, like, hey, you have the words to eternal life. Like, no. Like, they understood they had conviction. And they understood, like, man, only, only truth only come from God. Only good thing in my life can only come from my relationship with God. That's it. 
anything outside of that, inside, anything apart from God, you have no good thing. As it says in Psalm 16, verse 4, you know, and this was, the, this, was this guy's conviction. It was like, man, only Jesus has the words to eternal life. God actually knows what's best for my life. So, of course, I'm going to store up churches in heaven. Of course, I'm going to give up the worldly possessions. Why? Because God has a better plan for me in my life. And you know, here's the incredible thing. Even logically speaking, logically speaking, if you look at, man, verse 29 and 30, it's like, hey, you give up these things. God's like, hey, he will give you 100 times more. And here's the funny part. God only told him to give up one thing. One thing he lacked. And God was like, hey, in return, I'm going to give you 100 times more. That is a way better deal than anything. Like, think about that. Like, if I'm like, hey, Montreal, bro, uh, can I get $5? And he's like, oh, for sure, bro, I'll give you $5. And then I'll give you 100 back. Like, bro, like, that's a sweet deal, wouldn't you think? Like, if I'm like, hey, um, man, uh, uh, Brittany, you know, um, Let's go, Tyree. You know, can I borrow your bike? And then, like, next you know, Brittany has a car. You know, like, and I'm not saying, like, it's a prosperity gospel, but what I'm getting at is that God has a better plan for your life than what you think that you have for yourself, right? And so, like, it's a faith issue. Like, we don't trust God enough that God knows best for us. It's a faith issue. And so what we do in our humanistic thinking we act just like the rich young ruler. We're unwilling and we disagree and we don't give up the one thing that God is trying to yank from us. And so we don't grow. We don't grow in our relationship with God. Uh, we just stay in our sin um, and we walk away sad and very discontent because we wasn't willing to give up the one thing that God was trying to call us to give up. You know, and so what is that treasure? Well, and what is our reward? So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, it says, but what is our hope, our joy, our crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? It says, is it not you? The stored up treasure in heaven is the saved souls we get to help when we actually invest in building up God's kingdom, right? That's the treasure in, 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 in heaven, the saved souls that become disciples on earth. And we understand like what's bound in earth is bound in heaven. So once they enter the kingdom on earth and they're faithful to God on earth, guess where they get to go? to be a part of the kingdom in heaven. And you're storing up treasures in heaven because you're making disciples and you're being about God's purpose because you understand you're storing up treasures on earth being about your father's will. And so what's our reward in heaven then? Well, in Hebrews 11 verse six, it says, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he reward those who earnestly seek him. And it says God rewards those who seek him. And we understand God seek God with our whole heart. Well, what happens when we see God with our whole heart? Well, in Genesis 15, 1, when God speaks to Abraham, he says, I am your shield, your very great reward. You got to understand at the end of the day, our ultimate reward is God and God alone. Our reward is not, our reward is not marriage. <laughs> our reward is not, um, you know, money. Our reward is not worldly possessions. Right, our reward at the end of the day has to be God. And so when we store up treasures in heaven, that is what we are vested in. We're vested in a save to save souls that can make it to heaven one day, and then for ourselves to also be with God one day in heaven. At, outside of that, nothing else really matters because it's going to get destroyed, it's going to come to an end. Only thing that's going to matter is us getting to heaven and be with our God for the rest of eternity. And so that's why Jesus calls us as, as Christians to store up these treasures in heaven where, where the things, don't, you know, like moss and vermin don't destroy, but it's an eternal kingdom. It's an eternal uh, place where we get to be with God for the rest of our lives. And, and, and Lord willing, we'll see the essence there. We'll see the Sylvie's there. We'll see George's there. We'll see the Amanda's there. We'll see our brothers and sisters be, who we invested in here on earth and they stay faithful and they get to be with God in heaven. Some of you guys will probably see your families there. You know, some of you guys will see like those who, who, who are made into disciples on earth. We may see Montreal there, Lord willing, right? We may see Matthew there, Lord willing. And it's going to be awesome. And we get to be up there in heaven. Come on. And glory, glory, glory. Our Lord, our mighty, are you with me? Let's go, bro. Let's go. Let's go, Tyree. Come on. Appreciate that, man. Appreciate that word. Super with you.
sister. I want to lift up our dear sister, Brittany Ray. You know, Brittany Ray. Come on, sis. Who made the decision to Come on, Brittany. To invest her treasures Super into heaven. Golf. You know, to, to invest her treasures into heaven. When is last month she got baptized, you know, into Christ. And, and God's been using her in an incredible way to be a light, even in her community in North Oakland, to just like be an example of what it means to be a, a godly Christian woman. You know, I also want to lift up our brother, Bomani Howard, you know, who wants to become a Bible talk leader. And God Come on. on his heart. And he's investing his treasures into heaven by wanting to evangelize and become effective and build up the kingdom. You know, I got I to gotta lift up Mr. Let's Get It. I got to lift up, Mr. Let's lift up get our it. brother, Tyler Hicks. Let's get it. You know, Tyler been saving up his, his finances to blow Let's out social missions. You know, uh, and I the other day, I was like, bro, uh, your campus, you only need to hit your goal. Like, that's fine. Like, just hit your goal. And he's like, hey, bro, I want to give more. You know, I, I, I just want to give Jeez. more still what God has done for me and God's forgiven me. And I'm just so grateful that I want to give more and blow out my goal. And I told him, like, hey, bro, all you got to do is just give your goal. If you want to give more, you can. He's like, bro, I want to give more. And it just shows you the heart of the young Christians that we have in the Oakland region and on the call that they understood what it means to, 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 to store up treasures in heaven. Oh, not, come just, on. not just that. I want to lift up our amazing sister, Brianna Wheatfall. There she is. Our sister, Brianna Wheatfall, has been growing in her faith, growing in her love. Come on, Brianna. Super Offering serving. You so much this grow in, in your walk with God. You know, Brianna Wheatfall understands this concept. At this point, I know special missions is due in uh, November 22nd. Brianna Weepa already has blown out her special mission go. Why? Because she understands her treasure is in heaven. That's and crazy. this is the heart we all need to imitate, just like when we made the decision to make Jesus Lord at our baptism. You see, each disciple in our region needs to blow out special missions in order to see this world one for our God. And because we understand our treasures that on earth, but our treasures need to be stored in heaven. Yeah. Here, we're trying to plant multiple churches. We try to plant a, a church in Philadelphia, Cameroon, Congo, Scotland, Alabama, Rhode Island, St. Louis, Missouri, Bahrain, Detroit, Portugal. And it's just to name a few. Man, we got to get to all the four corners of the world. Why? Because we're going to see more souls saved. Come on. I mean, we got to blow out our women's day. You know, amen. Shout out to the sisters, right? Working so hard. I want to let them my incredible wife leading the women and all the women just making this going to be an awesome. Let's event. go, JL. You know? and, yes, then, and, if JL. and if I haven't mentioned it, I'm going to mention it again as a plug. You know, 7 p.m. on Zoom tonight is our Oakland Women's Day, the first historic ever event. Yes. It's going to be amazing. And we got to blow it out. I mean, it's been awesome to see God has already uh, have it more than more than one for one visitors there's like a ton of guests confirmed guests and the people families mothers sisters going to be all impacted by the love of the sisters in the kingdom you know and so we all understand our investment and treasures has to be in heaven and you got to think man like the rich young rulers did not get this concept one thing stopped them from experiencing all the fullness of god and his promises and it could be very much some of us on this call that God is just tugging at your heart that one thing that you lack, you know? And that could be that one thing that can stop you from actually staying faithful to God. It could be that one thing that actually stops you from growing and maturing in your walk with God as well. And you got to ask yourself, man, what is that one thing? And guess what? We all have that one thing. And so my call to you guys, and I want to encourage you guys, is store treasures in heaven by giving up everything and get recommitted like you were at the moment at your baptism. So you could grow and be the awesome men and women that God so desires for you to be. And if you're a guest here today, you know, and you're visiting maybe for the first time or a couple of times, and, you know, I want to challenge you guys to store up treasures in heaven as well, because God also has a great plan for your life. And, um, you know, the, the, to store up treasures in heaven by giving up your comfort zones, giving up your time and studying the Bible for two weeks so you can have a strong relationship with God. My family, in order for us to not be discontent, we got to value what's most important. And the way we value what's most important is that not only we store up treasures in heaven, but we also got to understand what God is teaching us and where he has us right now. And let this be an awesome Rocktober to remember. Let this be our Rocktober best where 
People say of the Oakland region, the disciples in Oakland, the men and women alike, totally blew out special missions, totally blew out Women's Day, uh, investing their treasures in heaven so we can see more souls won for our glorious God. And with that, I love you guys. To God be all the glory. Wow. <laughs> wow. That was awesome. Perfect. Family, that was amazing. So first off, I just Tyree gave us an awesome goal. He said to write 10 things that you are just grateful to God for. And I wrote them down, so I'm going to share them with you guys so you guys can go after it too. First thing I wrote down was the areas he shows me that I, that I, that in which I really need to grow. My family and friends in the kingdom. Third, the breath that I breathe for my home. Five, the food in my refrigerator. Six, that I'm safe. Seven, that my family and my friends are safe. Eight, I'm grateful for God's kingdom in general. Nine, everyone in the Oakland church. And 10, I'm grateful for how God was brought glory in this church service. Guys, the first point that Tyree hit on was embrace what God is teaching you. And this month, this week, even to this day, that is something I'm really going after to just embrace, just to let myself fully immerse in it. Guys, because here's the thing, if we're trying to be better people, man, you gotta go after your relationship with God. And I'm so grateful for Tyree for just, for just leading a lesson so vulnerably. We are grown up as men, especially here in the Bay Area, that if you're vulnerable, that if you show your emotions, that you're not a man. You're someone that people can get over. You're, you're people that people can walk over. But here in God's kingdom, vulnerability shows immense strength, guys. And that's what Tyree's calling us to do. He's calling us to go after God so he can reveal to us in the areas in which we need to grow. Guys, and I just, I just, I just so grateful just for everything that's been going on in the service today. There's, this is one of the most important things happening right now, guys. Guys, and if you were impacted, convicted in any way, I, I just call you as your brother, as your friend, as someone who, who, who loves you with the love of God to just change. If you're someone here, if you're a visitor out, please get back with the person who, who invited you. Study the Bible. Learn what it is to actually have a practical relationship with God. Everyone, everyone wants to go to heaven, but how, man, how are we going to get there? Man, it's a step-by-step -step plan. If, if you need a step-by-step -step plan to, to get a six-pack, how much, how, much how much more to go to heaven? It, it, it's, common, it's common sense. But here's the thing. Common sense is not common knowledge. So that's why we have to go after being taught. Guys, so I'm just so grateful for all the singers, for all, everyone who gave their hearts for contribution, for communion. It was so powerful, guys. But guys, 7 p.m. tonight, I know all you guys have moms. 7 p.m. tonight, we have a first ever Oakland Women's Day at 7 p.m. So please plug your auntie, plug your sister, plug your cousin that you only see on holidays but you don't really talk to. Even plug that cousin that probably don't even smell better. The lesson tonight will probably help her put on some deodorant. You don't, you, don't, you don't know. You don't know what can happen today. Guys, but here, I'm calling you guys to please just go after it. Help your people, help your friends, and one, and not least, but help yourself. Guys, and thank you so much for just coming out and just giving your hearts and worshiping. We're going to do one more song, but we have a surprise for you. We have someone who's going to be doing, doing a cameo song leading, and we have none other than Rashad
Thanks, Tyree, for preaching our promise. Thanks, Tyree. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Love you guys. Bye, Jasmine. Bye, Mama Andrea. Bye. You guys Bye. later. It's so good to see you ladies at Women's Day. <laughs> yes, Women's Day. I'm so excited. Right now, Love you guys. Love right. you guys. Bye. See you guys. Bye, guys. Love you guys. Love you, guys. Love you, guys. Love you guys. Bye. Okay, car. <laughs>